Mm, okay, good. Uh, so welcome everybody. So today we are happy to have Sasha Polishuk from the University of Oregon, and he will talk about super measure on moduli of super curves. So everything will be super today. Sasha, please. Okay, great. So thank you very much for inviting me. So maybe uh, as a start, I should mention that when my uh, one of my sons came to me while I was preparing my slides, he looked at this and he said how, how I should pronounce these things. So I will not keep this in my talk, but uh, he said you should do this like super measure, you know, like Superman. So, <laughs> this is a tip from, <laughs> from the younger generation, how you how you're supposed to talk about these things. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, so um, uh, right, so this is, uh, as, as you can see, this is a joint product, project with um, Giovanni Felder and David Kajdan. So, uh, the, uh, so the long term goal is to understand something that physicists do, so in particular something which is, uh, appears in papers of Witten uh, on so-called string supermeasure, which lives uh, over the modular space of super curves. So I hope to, uh, during this talk, at least, uh, I think one of my goals is to explain what these objects are. So this is actually quite uh, not non-trivial to explain what they are. So, and uh, here are the kind of necessary ingredients I have to talk about. So I have to talk about modulo of stable super curves. So which is kind of uh, compactification of the modulo of super curves. Uh, and uh, somehow it is only relatively recent uh, uh, work where uh, where the, the, the stable, stable super curves finally were kind of fleshed out uh, in mathematics. So um, there was kind of, there was a, I think in the end of 80s, a letter of Deline to Manion where he sketched how this should work out, but it, it kind of had to wait like almost 30 years to, or maybe more than 30 years to actually flesh out uh, the details. Uh, so, and then uh, I will talk about uh, something called Mumford isomorphism uh, on module of super curves, which is like the classical Mumford isomorphism tells you how to compute the canonical line bundle on this module space. And then uh, I will also need to talk a little bit about super periods. Okay, and this is based on uh, two papers which are on the archive and on the work in progress. So I think as I kind of near the end of this talk, it will kind of be uh, sort of more and more work in progress. And so at the end, I'll just stop because I won't know what to say because it's not finished yet. Okay, so, right, super geometry, right? So uh, I'm, uh, I'm not going to, uh, yeah, so, uh, so I, I must say that indeed uh, for, for a person who, who doesn't work in, uh, in super geometry a lot, so the, the first impression uh, you get is that it's kind of uh, just straightforward generalization of everything you do in the usual geometry. And, uh, and so it's not clear why, why should you do this because uh, you cannot really see uh, kind of more interesting structures than you see in the usual geometry. However, here, uh, uh, so yeah, yeah I, I guess I just ask you to bear with me because in the beginning it will look like that. But then uh, gradually you will see kind of features uh, which which appear which which are not available in the usual geometry, and so it will. So I think the the, the main one of the um, kind of things uh, that happen is that with with modulo of super curves, some of the, um, the there are some kind of uh, constellations which you do not have which you do not observe for the usual modulo of curves. So that would be kind of uh one of the things uh which is different in super geometry but uh, unfortunately it's it's a long way before i can explain this so i'll just start by explaining very very basics actually sasha sorry it just since the super pro it came from physics yeah like supersymmetry yes. and actually i think uh, I mean, it was not discovered in the nature, but it was invented exactly for the purpose of cancellation of some anomalies. Exactly. Yeah. So I think there are there are some known uh, there are some known results where uh, you kind of explain certain things which you observe in the usual mathematics using supersymmetry. So, for example, things like uh, Dusterman-Heckman formulas and things like that, where you kind of 
uh, I think this was explained by Albert Schwartz, you, where you can uh, kind of explain by adding super variables, things which you observe in the usual geometry. But okay, I won't go very deeply into this, but uh, okay, so let's start with the basics. So first of all, uh, instead of the usual commutative rings on which the usual geometry is based, we consider algebraic geometry is based, we consider super rings. So which are uh, always equipped with Z2 grading, and there is even part and odd part, and there is a super uh, commutativity constraint, uh, A, B equals uh, plus minus B, A, where, so the, so you get skew commutators, uh, skew commutation if you, uh, if both A and B are odd. So in particular, where I'm always going to work over complex numbers, so in particular characteristic is not equal to two, so square of anything, of any odd element is going to be zero in particular. Okay, so the very simplest example of uh, of things that you can consider is uh, a split super variety. So you just take a usual variety, usual uh, algebraic variety, and then a vector bundle over it. Okay, and then you consider the sheaf of algebras, which is just the exterior algebra uh, of this vector bundle, and you this has a Z two grading where uh, the elements of v lie in degree in odd degree and uh, so you consider this uh, uh, this uh, ringed space this is a basic example of a super variety so it's a, uh, yeah, so if x is a point so it's just a grassman algebra just grassman algebra exactly if x is a point it's just grassman algebra or you can sort of add three odd variables to any kind of purely even thing you see Okay, and uh, so the simplest example of a space that you, which you can consider, of course, is super affine space where you just have uh, polynomials in uh, some number of even variables and some number of odd variables. So this is this can be viewed as Grassmann algebra over the polynomial ring in even variables. So physicists call even variables bosonic and uh, yeah and odd fermionic. So Very that's much. origin. Yes, that's the origin of supersymmetry, right? So for every super scheme, uh, super variety, you have the underlying usual scheme or usual variety, which is called bosonic truncation. Yeah, so here is the word bosonic. So which means that you just kill all odd functions. So you, you mod out by the structure shift by the ideal of uh, generated by odd functions. So there is this canonical functor. Okay, so a slightly more interesting example is a super projective space. Uh, so you can consider you can consider homogeneous coordinates where there is some even homogeneous coordinates and some odd homogeneous coordinates, and then the open charts will still be given just by taking one of the uh, where one of the even coordinates is uh, invertible. So of course the odd coordinate cannot be invertible; its square is zero, right? So only only one of the even variables have to be invertible, and then you just uh, consider a fine chart with this with these coordinates. Okay, so now the first really uh, thing thing you have to keep in mind when working with super things is that there is a uh, slightly different version of super determinant. So when you want to use a determinant, uh, you actually uh, you actually have a little bit uh, stricter uh, rules in the super geometry because uh, determinant you can take uh, of any of any matrix, and in super geometry you can only take it for from inver of an invertible matrix. So uh, it's it's only defined on invertible matrix. So GLMN, this means that you consider uh, a vector space with um, even part of dimension M and odd part of dimension N, and you consider uh, all transformations, even and odd linear transformations. So you can view them, you can write them as matrices uh, in, written in block form, where A is kind of go, this is, matrix is going from even part to even part, C is going from even to odd and so on. So, so the entries of A and D are going to be even and the entries of B and C are going to be odd. So you should always think of this, uh, that there is some test ring, test super ring, which has some odd variables and some even variables. So otherwise, if you're doing this over the point, when I say that uh, B entries are odd, so if over the point there are no odd uh, functions, so you kind of have to always think that this is uh, happening over some test string. And so the, the entries, the, then some entries can be odd and some entries can be odd. So, so here A and D have even entries and B and C have odd, variable, odd entries, right? And then you just take the usual formula for the determinant in the block form, but it actually now makes sense because this matrix is invertible if and only if A and D are invertible. 
And uh, B and C, they actually are in, uh, they have nilpotent entries, so there is no problem. Uh, yeah, so, D, sorry, yeah, the main point is that D is invertible, right? <clears throat> and so like in the usual geometry, you can use determinant and you can apply it to vector bundles. So here you can also apply Berezinian construction to any vector bundle. And yeah, uh, it's multiplicative, it's a rational and, function. Yeah, exactly. So the main point, it's a hom like I wrote, it's a homomorph. Berezinian is a homomorphism so, of groups. And so, yeah, so for vector bundles, you can define Berezinian and it's also, uh, it's uh, yeah, so the, exactly. So the fact that the usual Berezinian is multiplicative helps you to, uh, you can apply it to transition functions and you will get transition functions for the line bundle. And uh, so it's going to be of rank one zero or zero one, depending on the parity of, uh, of the odd number of variables in the vector bundle. Okay, and so the, of course, the, um, in geometry, you're, the main uh, reason for doing the, applying the determinant construction is to get the canonical line bundle. So you, when, you, when you consider a super variety, you take the uh, bundle of one form. So it has some even part and some odd part, depending on how, so how many kind of even dimension and odd dimensions you have in your super variety, right? And so then you can take its Berezin and you get a line bundle, which is going to be either even line bundle or odd line bundle. So either of rank one, zero, zero, one, depending on what, um, uh, on what is the odd dimension of X. And uh, so indeed it is uh, known that there is an analog of cell duality with this guy uh, in place of the canonical line bundle. Okay, so this is already a somewhat advanced uh, super geometry. So I'm, I'm actually skipping here. So in fact, even this uh, uh, proof of the cell duality for proper X and not just projective X uh, is a relatively recent thing. So somehow uh, people were satisfied with just considering uh, uh, super varieties which are embedded into super projective space, but this is actually a significant restriction. It turns out that in, uh, in super geometry, the constraint to be projective, to be embeddable into super projective space is somehow unreasonable because a lot of natural spaces are not embeddable. In particular, if you just take uh, super Grassmannians, there are analogs of super Grassmannians. So most of them you cannot embed into super projective spaces. So here it's actually important. Uh, so this machinery of Grothendieck to work with proper uh, varieties in place of projective actually was, came, came very useful for super geometry. And in fact, I should just say in general that uh, this whole Grothendieck's machinery of working with nilpotents turned out to be extremely suited for the super geometry because in super geometry, essentially, it's like working with usual schemes with a lot of nilpotents because all the odd, vari all odd variables are nilpotents. So you basically have to apply, uh, kind of in most cases, you have to uh, apply kind of uh, usual geometries developed by Grothendieck, but you just have to make sure that you're applying results which apply to schemes with nilpotents. Uh, yeah, but they have like odd degrees because it's not just uh, kind of a fat schemes like. I know. I'm. I'm. I'm oversimplifying. Okay. Ah, so okay. You're absolutely right. But uh, I'm just talking that the flavor is like that of working with uh, schemes with nilpotents. Okay. Now uh, super curves. So here. Yeah, I still have to work on this super curve. <laughs> okay, so uh, so first of all, it's going to be a, over a point. It's a very uh, it's a very classical object. So it has to be a split super variety of dimension one one. So one one even one even dimension one odd dimension, and it's going to be indeed split. So you start with the usual smooth projective curve C. and then you need to add a line bundle of odd directions, and so somehow. The, 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 the constraint is that you have to consider not any line bundle, but you have to consider a spin structure, which means that this should be square root of the, can, of the canonical bundle on, on your curve. So you, you fix a spin structure. So there's finitely many choices. And, um, and then uh, you use this as odd directions uh, for your super curve. So the structure shift, the functions on the super curve is going to be just the uh, functions on C plus uh, in the other directions you take the spin structure. So where does this come from? So this is explained uh, when you try to define what it is uh, in family. And actually the real definition is of course the definition of what are families of super curves. 
So now you have to consider uh, something. Sasha, on this yeah? curve, of, on this OX, the superalgebra structure is L square equals zero. Right? Of course, yeah, because it's an odd, it's not direction, right? And it's just one variable. When you have one odd variable, its square is zero because because mm -hmm. of super super sun convention. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, that's absolutely correct. So when you when you write multiplication, the multiplication of L with L is going to be zero. But how the x L square you equals on the canonical? Yes. How is it? How? Why? Why such? Why to consider such structure? Indeed, this is. Uh, this will be explained in this next uh, in this next part. Okay. okay. So so in, it turns out that this uh, this plays uh, the following role. So. So the so you have to consider um, uh, so something of uh, relative dimension one one so family of uh, um, of such super curves. So what is it? So it should be relative dimension one one, and there should be a, a relative distribution. So in the tangent space, uh, in the relative tangent space, you should have a sub bundle of rank zero one. So by the way, this guy has rank one one because it's dimension one one, right? So in it, there should be something of purely odd rank of rank zero one and then when you consider the bracket so there is a lee bracket on the uh, on the tan on the relative tangent space right so when you consider uh, when you restrict it to the distribution it should be a kind of maximally non-integrable so when you when you take bracket of d with itself uh and you and you see how much it does not get you do you do not get back into t so you actually project it to the quotient then this should be an isomorphism, and uh, so it may it makes sense because on the left you have a line bundle of rank one zero, and on the right hand side you have a rank or a bundle of rank one zero. Okay, and so this is actually where the condition that L square equals omega comes from, as I will explain just a tiny bit later. So it turns out that from this uh, condition you can derive that D would have to be isomorphic to uh, inverse of the relative um, canonical bundle and the t over d will be uh, minus uh, relative canonical bundle to the minus two. <clears throat> uh, okay, so actually in the local coordinates there is uh, there is a kind of standard form uh, for, for this uh, relative distribution so you can think and this is actually important point of view so uh, uh, you can, instead of this embedding of uh, distribution into the relative tangent space, you can think of the dual map. So and the dual map goes from uh, one forms to the relative canonical bundle. And uh, so you can, uh, so whenever you have a O linear map from one forms, you can think of this as a derivation. So you have, you have a kind of canonical derivation uh, from the space from the functions okay here there should be no relative it's just functions uh, to uh, to the relative canonical bundle and uh, in some sense this uh, derivation will be will play a role like the Durham differential later and so locally you can choose uh, coordinates such that you trivial you can trivialize this line bundle and this will be just derivation on functions and it will be given by this odd derivation. So you take a uh, derivative with respect to the odd variable theta plus theta times dz. Okay, so uh, it's a theorem that uh, locally you can, at all locally you can choose such coordinates. Um, all right, any questions? Yeah, I still haven't, sorry, I ha still haven't explained the condition L square equals omega c. I will explain it on the next slide. Mm -hmm. So in d square equal to zero. Uh, that, 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 this doesn't make sense because it goes from one thing to another. It does not go from. Uh, Come, okay, in which sense? In fact, but in fact, if, if you take if you take this if you take this derivation and you take its uh, if you take its uh, square, it will not be zero. You will you will get dz. All right. So, in what sense you say, you said that it's an analog of the RAM? Yes, but for curves, the RAM has only one term, right? From O to the top forms. Ah, okay. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. So here is uh, uh, the kind of example. So suppose the base is even. So, for example, a point. So then. Uh, 
what is this? Um, so uh, yeah, I want to explain how this uh, structure is related to spin structures. So suppose you have a relative spin structure, and I show how to how to um, uh, see the corresponding derivation or the corresponding uh, um, distribution. So so okay. So the as I said before, so when you have this uh, L, which is a relative spin structure, you can consider uh, the super curve given by so the even part is just uh, uh, functions on C and the odd parts is functions on L. Then you can compute the relative canonical bundle and it will be this. So it will be a line bundle uh, of uh, of rank one zero. So it's actually generated by uh, sorry of rank zero one. It's generated in deg in odd degree and its odd part of this shift is just L. And its even part is the canonical line bundle of the underlying curve. Okay, now here is the first place where you see, uh, uh, so where you see the um, spin structure. So the, uh, the O modulus structure on, the, on this line bundle omega x x, uh, is so when you when you add by odd functions here you're actually going to be using the mm, uh, the fact that l square is omega so you'll be multiplying when you be multiplying l with l uh, yeah when we be acting by odd functions on the generators here you will be getting here okay and now the the, the structure derivation uh, which uh, uh, which was the um, kind of Part of the definition, um, which is kind of equivalent to the it's equivalent to the to this uh, datum of uh, of uh, distribution. Uh, so it's just given like uh, by this formula. So you have a pair of function a section of L, and here you need to get a differential and a section of L. So the section of L you just you just get from the section of L you had, and the differential you get from f. You take the function f and you take its, its uh, uh, take df. Uh, so, uh, so do I understand correctly that if you consider uh, a super curve as a functor, then when you restrict it to even basis, it just curves with spin structure. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So when you consider the moduli of, uh, yeah, when you consider it as a functor, exactly. Yeah. When you restrict it to even families, to, to even basis, it will be exactly the same thing as, um, uh, it will be exactly the same thing as uh, spin structures, and this means that when later I will consider moduli spaces, so the, there will be moduli space uh, of uh, super curves. It will have some uh, even dim even dimension, some odd dimension, and if I just consider the corresponding reduced space, the bosonic truncation, where I kind of throw away uh, odd odd directions, I will just get the moduli space of usual curves with spin structures. So this is kind of even underlying space to the super, super modular. In particular, there will be kind of different compactification. So that's, so yeah. So I, I, will, I will discuss all these things uh, okay, sorry. a little bit. So just wait for this, yeah. So, uh, right. So now back to this uh, remark about drum differential. So uh, if you have, if we're working over complex numbers, thinking about uh, in kind of working analytic categories. So when we have this family of super curves, so we can consider kind of a relative uh, constant shift. So, uh, so these are functions which are constant along the fibers. And uh, so it has the resolution, which is like the RAM resolution. So you have, uh, you, you, so you can replace it by, Structure shift mapping to this uh, relative Berezinian uh, with, with this canonical derivation delta. So that's why I said that it plays a role uh, of the RAM differential because in this way you get this resolution for the constant functions. <clears throat> uh, right, and actually this is uh, one of the ways to see the super period map. So if you consider, uh, if you consider uh, uh, so some point on the base where the corresponding, so when I fix a point on the base, I can just restrict the family to this point and I get, uh, then I just get the spin, cur uh, spin cur curve, so a curve with a spin structure. And I can look at uh, whether the spin structure has sections, okay? And the good situation is when it doesn't have sections. So in this case, the, so I can take a push forward of the, uh, of the relative Berezinian 
And this will be kind of analog of the Hodge bundle in the case. So in the theory of usual curves, you know, you take the you take the bundle whose fibers are uh, uh, regularly differential on your curve, right? So this pi star omega x, this is uh, kind of analog in our setting of the Hodge bundle. But here we unfortunately don't necessarily know that it's a bundle. So we need this assumption. We need the assumption that the underlying spin structure has no sections. Okay, so this is a good case. Then this is indeed locally free, it's a bundle. And furthermore, if you look at the connecting homomorphism for this. Uh, sequence of shifts so it goes from pi star of omega to this local system uh we'll just take kind of uh, uh h1 of complex uh, of the of the underlying curve with complex coefficients so in the case of the usual curves this would be exactly the kind of um, uh the the things that you use to compute periods so you have this uh Hodge filtration sitting inside h1 of the curve Right, so you have uh, embedding of regular differential into H1. And uh, so here again, this is true that this is going to be embedding of sub bundle and this will be, a, this will be of, uh, of rank, of pure even rank G0. This is a pure even rank to G0. So, and then uh, uh, this will kind of be like the period map. So it's called super period map. Okay. Now, uh, unfortunately in the, uh, super case you also uh, so so there are, there is a whole divisor on the modular space if, if you consider even spin structures so so by the way for for spin structures it's known that there are two connected components for the usual modular space of curves with spin structures there is a connected component of even spin structures so these are those for which the dimension of the space of global sections is even and there is a connected component of odd even structures so if you consider um so any spin structure which has global sections which are non-zero, then in the neighborhood of this point, this this shift will not be locally free. So this is a kind of complication for this theorem. Okay, now I'm going to discuss a little bit model of super curves, and then I'll talk a bit about about uh, compactifications. Right. So for usual model of super curves, this has been uh, already known for some times, maybe from the end of 80s or maybe beginning of 90s so there were various approaches and uh, works where it was proved that uh, there's a nice modular space so a smooth delin mumford super stack of smooth super curves uh, of genus g and uh, here the genus is the genus of the underlying usual curve and it has uh, so the underlying uh, even space is a kind of finite covering of the usual modular space of curves so it has the same dimension Okay, so this should be switched. Sorry, uh, this goes so three G minus three even dimensions and two G minus two odd dimensions. Uh, right. So it, it's so yeah. So in the case when G is bigger than or equal than two, then you have some odd di odd directions to G minus two of them. Right. So as I said, the bosonic truncation is just the usual uh, curves with spin structures. So how can you see? Uh, so how can you see this two G minus two? Uh, uh, even the uh, odd directions, right? So to see them, you need uh, to compute the tangent space. So you need to compute uh, infinitesimal uh, deformations um, of, of one single curve. So as usual, with any geometric object to compute uh, tangent space of this functor, you need to look at the shift of symmetries. So what is the shift of symmetries? So uh, so the usual, if, if we just consider um super varieties without any structure this would be the tangent shift but where uh, we have uh, this extra datum of distribution so this means that we have to consider a sub shift of only those vector fields which can which preserve this distribution and so these are called super conformal vector fields so there is this sub shift here and this is by the way uh, is not stable under multiplication with a function so the condition of being super conformal is not only is not o sub shift so, however, there is a nice feature that if we project this uh, uh, shift of um, super conform vector fields to the quotient uh, by the distribution to T modulo D, then this projection is actually an isomorphism of shifts. So, uh, so, uh, so when from this calculation, we get that uh, we actually have to consider H1 with coefficients in some coherent shift in this shift uh, uh, omega to the minus two. Actually, I don't understand. It said the, the preserving the distribution P. 
Yeah, yeah. So all, the super, all the super D brackets. Yes, mm -hmm. preserving by the super D bracket. Exactly. Okay, That's exactly you. the condition. So this means that these are vector fields such that it's a kind of a lomonizer of this. Such that the bracket of B with D lies mm -hmm. again in D. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, so in general, you can think of a vector field as uh, as an infinitesimal automorphism. So it makes sense to say what it what that preserves any any geometric structure. So mm -hmm. you just apply this infinitesimal automorphism. Right, so now, um, we, because we, we can compute what this uh, shift is, so it has even component, uh, which is just the tangent shift to the curve, uh, to the underlying curve, and its odd component is L, L inverse. So this is exactly where this 2G minus two directions come from. So this space is 2G minus two dimensional. So these are the odd directions. Yeah, I keep. Uh... Yeah, and this globalizes. This computation globalizes. So there is, uh, if you take universal super curve, there is this Kodaira Spencer isomorphism which identifies tangent space um, with this uh, R1 p star uh, of this uh, omega to the minus two. And uh, so this is useful because uh, if you want to compute the canonical line bundle. Uh, of, uh, of the modular space, you can pass to the Berezinian of this, and then uh, there is some techniques to work with the Berezinian of these guys. Okay, any questions so far? So besides of this H1, it's just parallel to the usual uh, construction of the modular space. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, what's a little bit unusual is the this appearance of this shift of super conformal vector field. So, I don't think we have any analog of this in the usual case. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, okay. So, now I'm going to say something about the compactification. So, as in the usual case of moduli of curves, we need to consider stable curves. So, stable super curves. So, this definition was invented by Delin in the letter to mine in, in 87. And uh, so the main point is that you you have to keep this datum of the of the derivation. So this has to be global thing. So so X is now allowed to be um, singular. So it has to be uh, still kind of relatively coin McCoin morph. So it means that the uh, this relative dualizing shift makes sense as a shift. And uh, so there are some extra conditions on this derivation and on the curve x so the first of all yeah the main one is that the, the main, yeah maybe it's the third one that this derivation when you restrict it to odd parts of these shifts it, it, it has to become an isomorphism but uh, so the first ones are kind of more obvious ones so there should be a dense open subset where everything is smooth and uh, when you reduce uh, when you kill the importance you should just get the usual family of stable curves Okay, and uh, immediately I need to give you an example. So what happens uh, if you're doing this over a point? So what is a stable super curve or over a point? So this turns out to be a, a, a pretty standard way of compactifying the model of uh, curves with spin structures. So we just allow L not to be a line bundle anymore. So we allow the curve to become stable curve and we allow the line bundle to become a torsion free shift. And now instead of writing L square should be a isomorphic to omega, this kind of makes less sense now because L is not a line bundle. So it makes sense to write this in this form. So it should be isomorphism from L to home, from L to, uh, to the uh, omega C. So that's what becomes, um, that's what becomes uh, with uh, kind of over a point or more generally over, over even basis. And it turns out that this is precisely the it's it's equivalent if you use this kind of notion of stable uh, of stable uh, super curves over a point or sorry this kind of notion of of stable uh, spin structures spin curves this turns out to be equivalent it gives you precisely the same modular space that uh, was considered by Carnalba uh, so Carnalba was just trying to con construct compactification of the module of spin curves. And uh, so it turns out that, uh, so his notion is formulated slightly different, but it turns out to be equivalent to this one. So it's, uh, so there is an important uh, uh, feature here is that there are two possible behaviors near a node. 
So if in the stable curve you have a node, so there are basically two uh, two uh, cases. Either either this uh, generalized spin structure, either this L is locally free, it's uh, it's still a line bundle near the node, or it's not. So if it's not, there is only there is exactly one other torsion free shift of rank one near the node, namely the ideal shift of the node. So it has to be either isomorphic to the ideal shift of the node near the node, or it should be locally free of rank one. And uh, this corresponds to what in physics called the uh, Ramon case and Niveau Schwartz case. So Niveau Schwartz is when it's not locally free. Okay, any questions? Uh, Sash, uh, uh kind of you will not be uh, speaking about that but if i will be interested in some analogs of uh, shifts like stable shifts and so on so on uh, is there a conceptually different theory yeah i think there should be a conceptually different theory because somehow you should uh, you should devise what to do with this extra structure of distribution Maybe maybe there should be some kind of connection on this ship along this uh, along this zero along this dis odd distribution, so kind of action of this odd derivation on your ship. Uh, and it, you, yeah, I, I actually never never seen anything like that. But uh, this is a good question. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, if you just consider if you just consider a vector bundle without any interaction with this uh, extra structure we have on the uh, on the super curve, it's not clear why why to consider such things. So there should be some kind of odd connection. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. So now moduli of super curves. So again, this is surprisingly. It took surprisingly long time to flesh out the details of this. So there was a sketch of the construction in the paper of Delin. Oh, sorry, in the letter of Delin to Manion in '87, and then. Uh, only recently, so there appeared some uh, written uh, accounts of how this is constructed. So, in uh, I think Mo Savian and Joe did it in 19, uh, and uh, we did it in our paper as well. So it's very close. But um, yeah, so the the main point, of course, is you have to study deformation and you have to construct local atlas. So it's kind of standard techniques, but it, there are some details that have to be worked out. And uh, so, yeah, so there is a good compactification of this. Uh, yeah, again, the, sorry, the dimensions again are switched. So 3G minus three even dimensions and 2G minus two odd directions. So the bosonic truncation is the usual moduli space of uh, stable curves with spin structure. Now, uh, yeah, so the, it's still kind of nice compactification in the sense that the divisor at infinity is the normal divisor. So, but uh, here, because there are, because there are uh, nil potents, you cannot just, you actually have to define the structure of the Cartier divisor. You have to give a kind of class of local equations uh, for the divisor at the boundary, but indeed there is a canonical choice. Um, yes, and also you can, uh, like in the usual case, you can consider Super curves with punctures. So um, I will in in so and here it's a bit complicated because there are two kinds of punctures. So in this uh, talk, I will only need punctures of one kind, which are just the same. Uh, you just use the same definition as in the usual uh, curves case. It's, it is a just uh, kind of sections, kind of relative mark points. So nothing nothing fancy there. Okay, so now I'm finally. Uh, switching to kind of more interesting stuff. So Mumford isomorphism. So this is, I'm reminding what uh, what um, uh, it does in the classical case. So on the usual modular space of um, of curves. So this is before compactification, just smooth curves of genus G. So you consider uh, you can consider um, canonical bundle on this modular space. And uh, so Mumford isomorphism tells you that this is the 13th power of another line bundle, which is uh, the determinant of the Hodge bundle. So it's uh, uh, obtained by taking determinant bundle. So you take push forward either of structure shift or of the relative canonical bundle, and then pass to kind of determinant of the complex. And uh, this gives you this line bundle lambda. Now, uh, in the case uh, of, in the super case, 
you have a similar uh, isomorphism and it's actually established similarly only easier actually this is maybe the first case with which manifests some cancellation supercase so the proof of Mumford isomorphism in supercase is easier and the, and the power is different so it's now so this analog of the line bundle lambda so it's called the bare one here so yeah because this lambda is sometimes called lambda one so you just take the push forward of the structure shift or push forward of the derived push forward of structure shift or derived push forward of a cano relative canonical bundle and then pass to Berezinian. And then the, the fifth power of this turns out to give you the uh, relative canonical, uh, ju just the ca canonical bundle of the, um, uh, of the uh, modular space. Uh, is it five is 10 divided by two? I mean, yeah, in the same two. way as 13 is 26 divided by yeah, two. Yes, that's why I'm asking. That's you. correct. Yeah, so this is where this, uh, yeah. It's this a dimension of the string background in, in yes. the Masonic case and one half of them and one half yes, of the yes, dimension. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so th this is a relatively old work. I think uh, I I've seen it in the paper of Voronov, uh, maybe also in the end of 80s or something like this. So, and it's a it's combination of uh, three things. So it's combination of uh, Kodaira Spencer isomorphism. So from the Kodaira Spencer map, which we discussed, passing to Berezinians, you get uh, identification of canonical bundle with Berezinian of O omega to the minus two. Then you use cell duality to switch from omega minus two to omega three. And finally, the, the, there is a kind of non-trivial ingredient, which is, so you use the Lin's formalism for determinant bundles. And uh, usually it involves some kind of uh, bilinear uh, symbol for line bundles, uh, which is called the Lin symbol. But the remarkable thing is that in the super case, it cancels out, it's, it's canonically trivial. So, okay, I won't go into details, but this was, Mm, already known uh, back in the 80s. So there is this nice constellation going on. Uh, okay, so now finally I want to uh, introduce the main uh, uh, object. So this so-called string supermeasure. So it's going to be defined on the, uh, more or less uh, on the open subset of the, uh, of the modular space uh, of super curves. Uh, so yeah, so the point is that we want we want to get uh, some measure. We want to to get something. So the physicists want always want to get a number. So they want something that you can integrate. So we want to get the measure. But uh, the annoying thing is that the Mumford isomorphism only gives us uh, isomorphism of the canonical bundle with something else. So we need to get rid of this term, ber one here. So how do we get rid of this? So uh, so kind of roughly speaking, this was. Uh, the bundle determinant of the bundle of global differentials. Okay, so modular some details. So on the global differentials, we have a canonical Hermitian pairing. So if you have if you have usual curve and you have two global differentials, you can integrate uh, one differential against uh, uh, another conjugate. Okay, and so this works. Uh, this works in super case, but you have to be slightly careful. So the way we do it is the following. So, uh, so first of all, we consider this uh, open subset where where the um, where the spin structure has no section. Sorry, this should not be x. This is what I denoted as S G. I don't know why it's called S here. So this is the modular space. Uh, so on this open set, we have uh, we have this uh, embedding, which which is kind of uh, the one which is used to compute periods. So we have embedding of the bundle of global differentials into the cohomology, into the local system of H ones, and uh, this uh, local system actually is a, has a symplectic form. You you have uh, just the usual topological symplectic form on H one, and also equipped with the real structure. So from this. When we restrict this to, to F, we get the Hermitian form. We can just take a pairing of X with Y bar, and this defines the Hermitian form on this bundle F. But actually for us, it's going to be convenient to sort of keep uh, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic parts separately. So it's convenient to work on the product of this uh, space with the complex conjugate. So, so that holomorphic coordinates live here and, and 
and, uh, and uh, anti-holomorphic leaf here, and then work kind of near the diagonal in this product. And uh, so there we just have a holomorphic pairing between uh, the bundle F and the bundle F bar. Okay, so this is just technical detail how we how we want to think about uh, about uh, Hermitian forms. So we want to kind of keep holomorphic variables and anti-holomorphic variables separately. Okay, now finally we can get rid of B, of this uh, Berezinians in the Mumford isomorphism. So so using the Hermitian form, we get this identification uh, between vector bundles, and passing to determinants, we get a canonical element in uh, in this product Berezinian. Uh, uh, in the first, in the holomorphic factor, and uh, conjugate to Berezinian in the second factor, and so now, so now we can combine this with Mumford isomorphism. So Mumford isomorphism was was an isomorphism from power of Berezinian from this bear one to the canonical bundle on the modulus space. So now we can take this Mumford isomorphism together with its conjugate and apply it to the fifth power of this element, and then we get a measure. Uh, on this product of two spaces, which is defined near the diagonal. Okay, so and then uh, okay, so the the part which I'm absolutely not going to talk about is how to define the cycle over which you integrate it. So the cycle has to be somehow supported on diagonal, but it has to have some extra odd directions, and so one has to somehow argue that up to homotopy, there is a unique, there's a canonical way, a canonical choice of the cycle of which to integrate. But what I am going to be concerned mostly is not the discrete, is not the discussion of the cycle of which you want to integrate, but rather uh, I want to discuss this problem that this is defined on some open subset. And so we need to study uh, the polar behavior at the divisors that we threw away. Okay, so in order, in order to define the integral, you need to see what divergences you have uh, uh, on the on this uh, on this uh, divisor at infinity, and so uh, this is uh, yeah. So this is what is uh, written here. So I'm interested in behavior of this supermeasure near compactification, near the boundary of the compactification, and the first problem it appears even before considering superstable uh, curves because we threw away this divisor where the underlying spin structure has sections. Okay, so the first thing you have to analyze is you have to analyze the structure of this divisor where the spin structure acquires sections. Okay, and so for this, I'm going to, so, so the next part is some very, very classical uh, 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 picture, which is just about curves with spin structures. So I think maybe it's from paper of Harris or maybe Harris and Mumford. So anyways, it's a very, very classical picture, which we then kind of mimic to, to, get, uh, to get what we want. So maybe I should say by, from the start that one of the goals is going to be to check that at least in small genus, uh, the, this super measure does not have a singularity uh, inside the modular space. So you only have to go to this uh, super stable curves. So along this divisor uh, corresponding to um, spin structures which acquire sections, it should extend um, it should extend regularly. Okay, so here is a classical piece of algebraic geometry. So suppose you just have a usual curve with a spin structure. So L is a square root of line bond of a, of a canonical line bundle. Then there is this uh, very nice way of representing of representing um, the space of global sections of the spin structure as some uh, as that intersection of two maximal isotropic subspaces in a, uh, in a vector space with a non-degenerate symmetric form. Actually, this is uh, this is needed when you want to show that the parity uh, of the dimension of H not uh, of L does not change in families. So when you want to show that there are Two connected components of the modular space of spin structure. This is what you can you can use. So this is done as follows: so you fix a point, you pick an extra data, you pick a point, and then uh, you uh, consider the following vector space. So you consider the sheaf of sections of L where you allow poles of order up to n at p, and then you mod out by sections uh, where you uh, prescribe uh, zeros of order n. 
Okay, so then this becomes a vector space of dimension 2n, and it has a canonical uh, non-degenerate symmetric form. Namely, if you have two sections, you multiply them, and you get a one, you get a differential. So it makes sense to take a residue at p. And this is, you can check that this is well defined. And this is a symmetric bilinear non-degenerate form in this vector space. So now this vector space has two natural maximal isotropic subspaces. One is just the image of the space of global sections of uh, L twist, twisted by NP. So you consider global rational sections of L with, with poles at most of order N at P. And its image is one maximal isotropic. So here, the fact that it's maximal isotropic follows from the residue theorem, because you will be just taking residue of of a, of a differential of, which is regular everywhere outside the point P. So because sum of residues is zero, the residue at this point also has to be zero because there are no other polars, no, no other singularities. And the second isotropic subspace is just uh, where you don't have poles. You consider uh, sections uh, of L quotient by L of minus NP. This is another maximal isotropic. And if you take the intersection, you get precisely the space of global sections of L. But in fact, uh, it's, uh, there's a little more here. So in fact, uh, if you consider this complex, so, L1, so you have two isotropic L1 and L2, two isotropic subspaces in V, which is a non-degenerate symmetric space. And you, pro you embed L1 into V and then project to the quotient by L2. So of course the kernel is going to be intersection, but there's also co-kernel and this whole complex precisely computes the homology uh, of, uh, of line bundle L. And uh, the point is that this makes sense uh, in families. And uh, when, you are, when you do this in families, this allows you to give a very nice um, definition of the equation of the divisor. So if you have a family where generically spin structure has no sections, and then on some divisor it acquires sections. So then you can actually write a nice equation for this divisor. Okay, so assume we have such a family, right? So this is a family of curves with spin structures, and generically the spin structure has no sections. So then the claim is that uh, you can uh, actually, locally, you can represent the push forward of L. So when kind of uh, the homology of, of the spin structure, right, in family. So you can compute them by a complex uh, of a very nice form. So it, it's just going to be uh, given by some skew symmetric map. And what it means in particular that I can take a Pfaffian of, of, this, uh, of this map and the Pfaffian of this map will, will be the, this equ nice equation of the divisor. Uh, where, where the global sections appear, where the dimension of, uh, of this LS jumps. Okay, so here I have uh, a bit of argument, uh, but I don't know, maybe I will not go into the details of the proof. So I think I will post this note so you can try to understand the details later, but basically it's, uh, it's very straightforward. So uh, you, just use, uh, you just use the fact that the so the, the skew symmetry appears from the fact that when you consider, when you have a non-degenerate uh, uh, symmetric space, so space with non-degenerate symmetric form, and you have, uh, you split it into two is isotropic, some of two isotropic spaces, and then you have a third isotropic, uh, maximal isotropic guy. Then when you write it as a graph of a map between those two, it will be a gr graph of a, of a skew symmetric map. This it's a well-known uh, kind of linear algebra factor. Okay, so now, uh, so in, in the super world, I, I have to apply this, uh, this kind of similar picture, but, uh, but uh, the, this whole previous picture will appear kind of in odd directions. Because remember the spin structure, it was actually the odd part of the, of the sheaf of functions. So therefore, uh, because, uh, so there was some symmetric pairing on the odd, in the odd direction actually, in super world, this counts as a super, as a as a skew symmetric. So it will actually be symplectic uh, picture in the super world, which actually manifests itself as some symmetric pairing on odd uh, on odd parts. Okay, so um, right. So what we are going to uh, study is uh, right. So we need to study this kind of behavior of this map. Uh, so which 
I said I said that this map is an embedding of a sub bundle when when you work near a spin structure which has no sections. But now we have to analyze what happens with this map near the uh, point where the spin structure has a section. Okay, this is uh, so this divisor of such guys is called null theta null divisor. So all right, so it turns out that uh, the, the, it's 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 kind of the, the nice setup for this will be if instead of this, this map you will uh, study a related map where you fix some Lagrangian sub bundle here. Okay, so for example, this comes from a this comes from a local system. So locally, you can just uh, trivialize this and so pick. Uh, pick a splitting at one point, so you sp split H1 into two, two um, Lagrangian pieces and use the corresponding Lagrangian subbundle here. So, so it's kind of there's a nice setup for studying this uh, the behavior of this map. Okay, and uh, so 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 this analog of the of this classical construction for spin structure, which I just uh, described. So it gives you the following. So it gives you some symplectic bundle, which will be of rank 2n to n. Okay, and uh, there will be a pair of Lagrangian subbundles in it, such that uh, the corresponding complex kind of describing intersection of these Lagrangian subbundles is related now. Uh, so it's uh, okay, maybe it's not clear for yet now, but it's related to something which we have here. So or, or rather here. So this, um, uh, yeah. So here I have uh, kind of certain embedding of uh, struct of, of just trivial bundle plus this Lagrangian subbundle in degree one into this derived push forward of OX. Uh, so maybe, uh, yeah, maybe uh, it's, uh, you don't have to understand how it goes here, but rather uh, what's important for us is this. So this is precisely the map that I'm interested in, 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 in kind of uh, understanding its behavior. And it turns out that the corresponding complex is just the quasi, it's quasi isomorphic to the complex which comes from this Lagrangian intersection picture, which is kind of uh, strange because here you have, um, so yeah, so this is, the, so kind of the, the main point here is that the right hand side only makes sense on this open locus uh, where we throw away uh, this divisor um, uh, where spin structure has sections. Whereas the left hand side is defined everywhere. So it's defined locally, but it's defined uh, including, uh, including those points where, uh, where the spin structure has sections. So we're kind of extending this Lagrangian intersection picture. We're extending it to, to the more global one. Right, and so now, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so what, what happens now is that, uh, so whenever you have, uh, whenever you have a pair of transversal Lagrangians in symplectic bundle, so maybe with some even, some even or not directions, you can always define, uh, you can always consider the corresponding complex uh, map from the first one to the quotient to the second one, and you take, you can take it Berezinian. So here, this means just uh, taking, you first fix some basis and compute Berezinian of this map, but then when you keep track of the basis, you get a section of this line bundle. Okay, and this is going to be something which is only regular and well defined on the open locus where these two Lagrangians are transversal. So now the key key result which helps to analyze um, the situation with this map is that. If you have this pair of Lagrangians, which are generic transversal, and if you work near the point where even parts of these Lagrangians have no intersection, and this is indeed uh, what will happen in our setup here. So then uh, this uh, Berezinian, actually you can, uh, you can uh, extract canonically square root from it. And uh, what's uh, kind of crucial for us, no, it's not only that you can extract square root, but but this uh, square root, which I call F here, this is going to be a denominator for the inverse of this map D. So this map D, the inverse is only rational map. And uh, so in order to understand kind of um, the polar behavior of, of the super measure, we need to kind of, we need some estimate for the, what kind of denominators appear. And so here we have a 
kind of good estimate for denominators. So it's given in terms of the square root of this um, of this Berezinian. Okay, and this square root, of course, it, it's it's a function, but it's it's kind of hidden in this theorem. So, right, and this leads eventually to this uh, regularity theorem uh, that uh, so for for genus at most eleven. Uh, we prove that the supermeasure extends regularly over the theta null divisor in the even component. Okay, so we're only working in the even component because so this means that we're only considering even theta structures, even uh, spin structures. So uh, we don't know what to do with uh, uh, spin structures which are odd, which are odd because there uh, you have kind of on on the entire component you have mm, non-zero sections. So so this uh, kind of there is no analog of this picture. So here it's important that there is a just divisor where you have to extend to. Right. And uh, in the non super case, there is no such restriction on, on the genus or what? In the, in the non, uh, uh, okay. So in the non super case, uh, uh, there is no problem. There is no problem with this with this uh, theta null divisor at all, because, yeah, because there is no because, because yeah because the singularity does not appear there. So here the problem is that when you consider a super curve, uh, sometimes it has non constant odd functions. Okay, when you consider usual curves, it has only constant functions, constant global functions. Mm -hmm. So when you consider just just single spin curve uh, and the corresponding super curve it has non-zero non-zero uh, global yeah, functions yeah, yeah. which correspond to sections of the corresponding spin structure okay yeah. so this this is a problem so and then we're kind of precisely showing that this but what what's happened for higher new genera it doesn't matter what genus is this no, ah, they, they, ah, what, they, they, sorry, 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 sorry. What happens in this, uh, whether the statement is still true or not, we do not know. Yeah, so uh, this is a good question. So we, it's just that we show some uh, kind of restriction on the, so there is, so we bound the denominators that can appear and this is enough to show mm -hmm. that for genus at most 11, everything is okay. But we don't know what happens for higher genus. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think uh, physicists either. Maybe maybe they have some. Uh, yeah. So I think there is a remark. There is a rem remark in Witten's paper that uh, that this should be true for genus at most ten. So I don't know where he got ten, but uh, doesn't explain there. But uh, we get that this is true for genus at most eleven. Right. So again, maybe I'll skip uh, the proof. I'll just uh, maybe. Uh, to kind of explain the gist of it. So the, the, the appears this uh, F, which is kind of equation of this divisor. Uh, and uh, so then, uh, then you take the fifth power of some function, which, which can have poles, which, which have the following form. So the, po the poles that can appear here, uh, they can look like this. So you can, you can have, um, kind of pro product of some odd variables, but for each pair of odd variables on the in the numerator, you should have a, a, sorry. So so you can have kind of uh, the equation of the denominator, but for every f that appears in the denominator, there should be a product of two odd variables in the numerator, and that's how this uh, that's how this uh, uh, g equals eleven appears because uh, so there is f to the ten here, so so, so if, if you have a, if you have more, so the problem only occurs if you have more than 10 Fs in the numerator in the denominator. But if you have at least 11 factors of F in the denominator, then you should have 22. You should have 22 different odd variables. But uh, for G equals at, at most 11, the number of odd directions is, is at most 20. So you, you do not have enough odd variables to create such a high pole. Okay, so maybe I will uh, try to wrap up um, in the next five minutes or so. So, uh, so I'll just want to say a little bit about what happens um, at uh, other divisors of infinity. So when you consider 
when you consider kind of uh, divisors which were which which were truly compactified the modular space so you consider stable curves now so right so we have this boundary boundary divisor components which correspond to universe Schwartz nodes or Riemann mode and uh, so the claim first of all that uh, there is an extension of the uh, Mumford isomorphism so on the smooth part, uh, on the part corresponding to smooth supercurves, we just had the fifth power of Berezinian. So now, if you consider this uh, Mumford form, which is the kind of element here corresponding to the isomorphism, so this Mumford form acquires poles. So, and it will be either of order two or one, depending on which component of the boundary divisor you consider. And so we are especially interested in the component where the where you get a pole of divisor uh, where you get a pole of order two because uh, of so this is kind of more interesting for us because pole of order two would be hard to integrate so we need to see some constellation and so uh, kind of the main point is that indeed uh, there will be some constellation happening and uh, instead of pole of order two in the end the super measure will only have poles of order one okay so uh, so I can uh, maybe uh, continue a little bit more to explain the details of this. So basically one has to, um, uh, yeah, so this is just a generalization of this in the case when there are punctures. So one needs to consider punctures, uh, even, even if we're only interested in super measure for modular space without punctures, the punctures will appear when you analyze things near the boundary because the boundary divisors there themselves uh, product of lower dimensional modular spaces with punctures, right? So when you when you consider a stable curve, which corresponds to kind of you join two two curves uh, and form a node, then those two curves, you know, they they all they each have one puncture on them. So you would have to kind of if you if you kind of work um, with the behavior at, at infinity at one of the boundary devices, you'll have to also work. Uh, with modular space with punctures. So here I'm kind of saying what, what changes you have to make uh, to Mumford isomorphism if you, uh, if you include punctures. So, and I'm only, uh, I'm only considering what happens when you include the uh, so-called Niver Schwartz punctures, so which are just the usual marked points. So then you have to twist by additional line bundles, which are uh, like the psi classes which appear in Grom of Newton theory, you just take relative canonical bundle and restrict it to the marked point. Right. So yeah, this is the uh, description of uh, of this uh, some some of the boundary divisors. So where you just glue two curves of genus uh, of lower genus. So where g one plus g two is equal to g. So right. So the there is an important result which kind of uh, describes the most singular part of the Mumford's form. So this Psi G, this is the Mumford form on the uh, modular space of stable curves of genus G. And uh, so the Mumford isomorphism was from fifth power of Berezinian to the uh, canonical class, but it had poles. So you had, to sh you had to twist by two times the boundary divisor. So when you restrict it to the boundary, so you will have um, you will have canonical class of the boundary itself times uh, one more line bundle, which is the normal bundle to this embedding. And, uh, and the normal bundle to the embedding actually has this canonical splitting like in the classical case into Psi classes. This is like in Mumford's formula in the usual case. And then the claim is that, uh, so what you have to, so, uh, so what, what happens is that when you look at the kind of most polar part of the Mumford form. So you will actually recover uh, the product of Mumford isomorphisms on the spaces uh, SG11 and SG21. Okay, so this is actually what physicists expect that there is some kind of factorization of the super measure uh, of the polar part at the boundary, but this is actually not the end because this is still uh, for the pole of order two. So one has to do further computation. So one has to remember that there was this other ingredient, uh, there was this other ingredient uh, in the definition of super measure, which was this uh, Hermitian form, the deter determinant of the Hermitian form. So one has to study this term as well. And it turns out that this will partially cancel this uh, order, order two pole and it will become just order one pole. 
But uh, unfortunately, we only can do this uh, in genus two. So when we consider, so like I said, so the further we go, the kind of uh, more this becomes work in progress. So for genus two, we can get, kind of compute everything in some special coordinates. And uh, so, uh, right, so here actually, uh, this is not yet, uh, yeah, this is a more precise calculation of, uh, of the Mumford form near the boundary component. And then uh, there is this uh, computation of determinant of the, <coughs> of the um, super period matrix, which, which, is this, uh, which, which is this Hermitian form. And so kind of the, 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 the uh, upshot of all of this is that when you take the super measure, and you and you integrate out the odd variables, you only get first order pole along the boundary divisors. And this is kind of good because um, then uh, the, there is some regularization procedure, which uh, if everything works out together with some, uh, some there's some extra constellation that should appear, which is called GSO projection. And so if everything works out, this actually gives us, uh, will give us a way to define a convergent integral, but uh, okay. This so here I must stop because this is kind of more and more work in progress. So I would be happy to go into details, but like uh, because this is supposed to be more introductory talk, I realize that a lot of these details maybe are not necessary. But anyway, so thank you for your attention. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for very interesting talk, uh, Sash. What kind of mathematical? Uh, quantities we can derive by integrating over this super measure. Well, I, I just, some amplitudes, whatever. They're called, they're called, uh, yeah, if you just have, if you have no punctures, these are called string uh, vacuum amplitudes. Yeah, so I don't know what they're related to, but I think there is a work of um, Witten and Stafford and, St and Stanford uh, where they consider kind of uh, a lot of uh, interesting integrals over supermodular spaces. I think uh, they, they expect like, um, they expect, for example, various uh, symplectic volumes to behave kind of similar to uh, what is uh, happening in Mirzak Hani work. And uh, I, I expect that the, 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 the story with Grom, this kind of the Grom of Witten story sh sh should have some analog uh, for, with supermodular spaces. I think some people even tried to uh, think about um, kind of uh, Grom of it, uh, kind of what what kind of modular space you have when you have maps from um, from super curves to some target mass space. So yeah, I think uh, there's a, there's a kind of a lot of things that could happen here. But the simplest thing, even when there is no target space, I think there are already some integrals that physicists consider, which should be defined rigorously. And I think currently we're lacking the definition. Yeah, but uh, uh, even the gromov witten theory for the point is this conservative old story. Yeah. You have, uh, uh, either uh, here you have odd point and even point, so either an analog of this. Oh, okay, so first of all, if I just forget the superstructure, if I only look at the, uh, if I only look at the corresponding even modular space, then this even modular space actually appears very well in the intersection theory, the modular space of uh, spin curves. And this is called uh, the spin modular, right? So um, yeah, Ruan, this, Jarvis, is, this is the yeah. example of fun jarvis run theory for, for the potential X square and the group Z2. So, okay. so there are well known, there are well known, uh, there is a, so there is kind of everything corresponding. Uh, so there, 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 are, there is a corresponding um, kind of, uh, I, I think it, it turns out to, so when you look at the corresponding uh, Witten's class and then kind of you calculate, I think it turns out to just reproduce the usual Gromov Witten theory of a point, if I remember correctly. And super Verasora is acting and so on. So yeah, so I don't no no no, but this is this is just purely even theory with the, but but it works with the space which is the right. which is the underlying to the super space. So I don't know um, I don't know what uh, what the super story has to whether it has something to say extra about this theory or not. I don't know, but yeah, I think it would be interesting to study. But I, I think one has to look at these papers of physicists and to understand uh, what they're doing, like uh, this paper of Witten and Stanford, for example. 
Mm. It's interesting, yeah. Okay, uh, more questions? Mm, there were some questions during the talk. So, well, if there are no more questions, so th Sash, thank you very much. Thank it's you. very interesting. Thanks. And so then this is the end for today's seminar.